It's been a long wait, but Arlington finally hears directly from Lieutenant Rick Padrini regarding race and policing. The Black Lives Matter banner at Town Hall comes down, and not everyone is happy about it. And how a school in town welcomes students back with TikTok. All that and more up next. From McLennan Park to Spy Pond, from Poets Corner to the Mystic River, we have Arlington covered. We're your neighbors, a friend you can turn to. This is ACMI News. Welcome to ACMI News. I'm Kristen Bullier. We hope you are all staying safe and remaining healthy during these changing times. Speaking of change, there have been a number of developments in town over the past week. From Town Hall to TikTok, we're going to let you know what is happening now and what to expect in and around Arlington. Let's get started. The town has held a number of community conversations throughout the spring and summer. The final session of the original series was postponed from its early August date and took place this week. Anim Osmani reports on how this much anticipated public conversation unfolded. On Tuesday, September 22nd, Arlington Police Lieutenant Richard Pedrini presented his long-awaited apology and acknowledgement to the Arlington community for remarks that were published in October 2018 regarding race and policing. What he wrote spurred a sharp backlash and led to a prolonged, painful period of self-scrutiny in Arlington. Here is an apology Lieutenant Pedrini read out. I would like to take this opportunity to apologize for my comments published in the editorials that I authored in the MPA Sentinel magazine in 2018. My words were crude, highly offensive, and thoughtless. For this, I am truly sorry, and I apologize to everyone that I have offended or hurt in any way with these articles. The statement was followed by a discussion between community members and Pedrini, moderated by Michael Curry, former president of the Boston branch of the NAACP. Questions and comments were submitted prior to the session and were addressed live by Curry. Um, I think folks on this call, and this is an important point for you and I to talk about, Lieutenant Pedrini, feel that the statements you made that though may have, they may have been targeted at um, the Gannon or the Chestnut situation were pretty broad. Uh, there were comments that did not seem restricted to that, that you actually criticized uh, procedural justice as one of your comments, as though you've said you've been committed to procedural justice. How do you address the folks on this call and those who've been a part of the uh, Consensus Building Institute's in, uh, interviews who feel like having someone who believes these things uh, on the streets in Arlington with a gun and a badge and authority um, to exercise that what is perceived to be racial animus, um, that hatred. How do you speak to them when they're concerned that you did not get terminated, that you're still on the job and your option was restorative justice? Community members and residents also joined in on the meeting. A panel discussion was held featuring seven invited guests of different backgrounds. The panelists were given the opportunity to react to Pedrini's apology and comments made during the interview. So if it was only two years ago that you realized that, what happened to the your entire life being a police officer, right? Building that trust with the people that live within Arlington, because it wasn't two years ago that black people arrived in Arlington. The full community conversation with Lieutenant Pedrini is available at arlingtonma.gov slash community conversations, or you can also find it on ACMI's YouTube channel. For ACMI News, I'm Anim Osmani. According to a number of participants and observers, this session pushed this important public conversation forward. While it perhaps brought one chapter to a close, the story will undoubtedly continue to unfold, and ACMI News will be here to chart that progress. The issue of racial injustice remains prominent throughout the country. Here's Anim Osmani's coverage of the recent decision by town authorities to remove the Black Lives Matter banner from Town Hall and the reaction to that move. The Black Lives Matter banner hanging from Town Hall is expected to be replaced at the end of the month following a unanimous decision by the select board. What my proposal for the board to consider is, is to remove the banner at the end of September. On September 14th, town manager Adam Chapdelaine brought forth a proposal to the select board to work with the Arlington Human Rights Commission to replace the banner with a more inclusive message. The proposal came as a result of the competing demonstrations that were held on September 10th, which Select Board Vice Chair Joseph Kuro believes were connected to mischaracterizations of the BLM banner's meaning. One thing that I regret is that, you know, I, I spoke of mischaracterizations of the phrase Black Lives Matter. 
um, being off the mark. And I, 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 that language is probably a little too soft because um, what really, what I think the crux of the issue is a lot of people are hearing Black Lives Matter and somehow they're, they're mentally sticking the word only in front of it. They're building up, the, one, of our, one of the people who spoke, um, I, I think it was Todd Beerson spoke during a public comment period the other night, was talking about false dichotomies and, and that creates a false dichotomy. The fact is all, all lives can't matter until black lives matter. And our black, um, residents and, and their ancestors have been suffering systemic racism, enslavement for over 400 years, and, and, and the challenges there are, are unique. Um, so I, I regret that I didn't, I wasn't more clear in, in my language. Um, At the September 21st select board meeting, community members voiced their concerns about the BLM banner replacement with many expressing their strong opposition to taking it down. The rhetoric surrounding the removal of the batter shows that the select board only sought to appear committed to justice when it was a good PR move and not when it was hard work. The board should not remove the banner and should apologize for the harmful and dangerous rhetoric espoused last week. I understand that you plan to hang a different sign espousing our town's beliefs about respect for all, but in my opinion, hanging such a sign is not the same as what the Black Lives Matter sign represents. The meeting opposed the decision to replace a banner. Other Arlingtonians, however, are more supportive of the town's efforts around diversity. But, you know, I think Arlington is doing pretty much the best that they can do um, to promote diversity, actually. It's been a, an objective of Arlington for a long time. And actually, they're doing really well. I think. One Arlingtonian offered his own suggestion for a message that could be posted on top of Town Hall. Hate free, accept, embrace, and love. Simple. As you can tell, emotions continue to run high. This is clearly an issue with no easy resolution, but which nonetheless demands our best efforts. For ACMI News, I'm Anim Osmani. In other news, school has started at Arlington Catholic High School and with a creative twist. Here's reporter Maxim Isaac with more on how the school is using social media to say, welcome back. Arlington Catholic High School has a distinct way of welcoming back students to the new school year. Last week, students were surprised with a TikTok video with a song you may be familiar with. It's the Full House theme song. After finishing their first week of classes, students found out their school made their first TikTok video. Um, I thought it was like funny and informative, especially with like a lot of the teachers who work in the office. You don't always know, see them and know who they are. So as a freshman and even like a sophomore, I saw like faces I didn't know. So it was like good for information. Um, I thought it was really good. It was like really well crafted together. And I like how they're staying up to date on social media, like with the student body and everything. And like, I think it really helped to get to know the staff, especially if you're like an incoming freshman and you don't know who anything, who like anyone is in the like building. It helps to get to know them a lot more. Throughout quarantine, there was a viral trend of videos using the Full House theme song around the country. But close to home, Northbridge High School. Evening TV. Did I get delivered here? Somebody tell me, please. This whole world confusing me. Created a quarantine version to let students know they miss them, and recently, a school like this one. Norton Middle School got the chance to make a video with cameo appearance from Boss Saget himself. 
This staff were the masterminds behind those videos, but it was an incoming senior who inspired this effort at ACHS. Well, uh, during quarantine, you see like a lot of the Full House videos were like uh, going viral on TikTok. So when I came to school, I thought it would be a good idea to do one with the staff. So told yeah. Jackie about it. So and... on Mary Kate's first day of school last Monday, she came straight to my office and said, Miss Garvey, I think we need to do a TikTok. And in my head, I said, nope, not doing a TikTok, not the audience we're looking for. Um, I don't know how to use TikTok. We're not doing it. Then I went to a meeting where a, another staff member said, we need to introduce the staff. We've introduced the faculty before. We need to tell people who the staff is. And in my head, I said, Mary Kate was right. And right she was. As of right now, the video has reached over 1,000 views on TikTok, and even most parents are impressed with it. The parent responses were really great too. Um, I'm an alum from the school. I graduated in 2016, um, and a lot of like friends of mine and um, people who I went to school with like reached out to me, and they were like, "Wow, you did a really good job on this TikTok." So I think the response was pretty positive. Director Garvey says this is the first time the school has used TikTok. And she plans to make it part of their social media approach in the future. For ACMI News, I'm Maxim Isaac. What a wonderful introduction to the start of the year. Next, the Assistant Director of Planning and Community Development sat down with ACMI's In Young Kim to discuss the return of a tenant assistant program designed to provide financial support to Arlington renters. It's a ray of light for individuals and families who continue to struggle under the stress of the pandemic. Many residents have financially suffered due to COVID-19. One piece of good news, some of those who have been impacted can count on help in paying their rent. The Arlington Emergency Tenant Assistance Program is providing a second round of rental assistance to households. The payment is up to $2,000 per month for three months and it will be provided directly to landlords. Applicants can qualify if their income is at or below 50% of the area median income. Those who applied for the first round are eligible to reapply. The Department of Planning and Community Development and MCO Housing Services will oversee the application process. Erin Jerko, Assistant Director Planning and Community Development, is here with more information. Um, so the Arlington Emergency Tenant Assistance Program is funded through a special allocation of community development block grant funds that we received through, funded through the CARES Act. Um, so we, we allocated $400,000 towards tenant assistance. Um, this is the second round that we're offering. Um, so it's a super easy um, application process and currently the pre-application is open. I asked her how many people applied in the first round of the assistant program. And ultimately we were able to fund 38 households. Um, so at that time, we've expended about uh, $140,000 to help people pay for their rent. Um, so it's very exciting and um, I hope that we will uh, continue to see the demand and be able to help more households as well as returning applicants uh, in the second round. I also asked what the applicants thought about the program. Yeah, so um, applicants that I've spoken with personally, either over email, um, on the phone, or um, through other methods, have been um, super uh, thrilled to receive the assistance. Um, so being able to provide a little bit of an additional assistance to take one, uh, one item off of people's uh, plates, uh, very stressful plates right now, has been um, very rewarding. So the response has been great and very thankful for the, for the assistance. So this being the second round, um, returning applicants can apply for an additional three months of assistance. Um, so I would encourage any returning applicants to apply. Um, in this round, we also increased the income limits a little bit. Um, so definitely check that out if you are ineligible um, to receive funding in the first round. Um, you may be eligible at this point. Um, and we anticipate providing future rounds, um, either through the funding that we um, received through the CARES Act or um, through a, a great allocation that we have received from the Community Preservation Act Committee um, to supplement the funds that um, we were able to allocate initially. The deadline for the application is September 30th. 
For more information, visit allingtonma.gov slash COVID-19 assistance. For ACMI News, I'm Inyoung Kim. Thanks, Inyoung. As it gets colder outside, restaurants are still feeling the heat as they seek to expand businesses while conforming to CDC guidelines. Anim Osmani tells us how one local restaurant is using their eclectic menu and innovative thinking to survive. Although Scrutra is one of the most award-winning restaurants in the area, this modern European eatery has had to deal with the same very modern problem as everyone else. Uh, my name is Louis Paparella and the business is Scutra Restaurant in Arlington, Massachusetts at 92 Summer Street. We've been here for just over 18 years. Started off as just 10 tables and have expanded once, twice, three, four times, which includes our most recent expansion, which is the patio in the back, which overlooks the bike trail. And then a temporary expansion of a tent um, in the front parking lot, which served uh, us tremendously during the COVID crisis. An upscale restaurant, once filled with tables set with beautifully placed napkin folds, polished crystal, and perfectly set silverware, is now barren. And that's always fun to have such a, 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 a nice setting for when a guest comes here because um, they feel good, you know, uh, they, they know that they're coming to a place that's going to uh, be at a higher level than your, you know, your average restaurant. And when I come in here and look at a bare table, um, it's, it's, it's a little sad, but we have to do what we have to do, and that's really the only option we have. And everybody understands, well, uh, most of everybody understands. Their success prior to their closing kept them afloat just barely. After shuttering their doors for four months, it took a valiant team effort to rebound. Once we, uh, you know, talked to the staff, we got everybody on board, um, which was a very interesting time. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's. It's a blessing to have such a wonderful staff that comes back during a time when they haven't been working for so long. Um, and just having that kind of support structure internally made it that much easier for us to rebound, get back on our feet, do what we love to do, do what we do best, and that's provide that premier top quality uh, food and service. The community also played its part in keeping Scootra up and running, but if you haven't been here lately, there are some changes you should expect. You know, the tables now are completely empty, but there's a little scan code in which um, is kind of, you know, I think a majority of the restaurants or, you know, a handful of restaurants are doing it right now. It's, everything has gone paperless, everything has gone digital. So a guest doesn't have to actually hold on to something, nothing tangible in their hands, nothing physical, uh, just less contamination. And, you know, by, by, uh, by law or by requirement during this, uh, during this pandemic, it's a um, single-use paper um, menus only. Um, we do have those available for anyone who doesn't have the, the you know, the phone, um, uh, that, which, you know, can scan the code. But when you scan the code, the menu pops up, which is, our, which is our website, and then you can kind of go through all the different menus we have. The newly installed patios couldn't have come at a better time when outdoor dining is a vital component for the restaurant industry. Additionally, there are added safety measures such as social distancing and face coverings. The manager has one last message for the community. Interview up with just letting everybody know thank you very much for the continued support that you've given us. Um, we couldn't do it without you. And I know that we are the product that we give you, but um, we're happy that, you know, uh, you are enjoying what we do offer and you're coming in and, um, you know, it's our job to keep you happy. It's our job to want you to come back. Scrooge Restaurant is open from Tuesdays to Saturdays from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., 9.30 on Friday and Saturday. For ACMI News, I'm Anim Osmani. I hope you had a delicious meal, Anim. In today's world, it seems like there are so many options to meet people online. From dating apps to social media, it has become pretty easy to make friends or to even fall in love online. But that's for people. What about our canine friends? I stopped by Thorndike Dog Park here in Arlington to see how local dog owners feel about the whole idea of a dating site set up for pets. Have you ever wanted to set up a play date for your pup or wish your furry friend had some friends of their own? Well now, look no further. Pinder, a play on the dating app Tinder, is a place where dog owners can go online and match their pets with some companions of their own. 
I stopped by Thorndike Dog Park in Arlington to see how local dog owners feel about the whole idea. I don't see anything wrong with it. I think it's definitely nice to make friends with other dog owners and have, you know, little friends that they know that they're good with, that they can interact with on a regular basis. So for that purpose, um, I think it could be great. Bobby lives in the area and he and his dog Grady stop by the dog park around two times a day. But dogs get nervous making new friends too. With a pet who can sometimes be as shy as Grady, he talks about how a sight like Pinder can help relieve some of that stress. Definitely, I think uh, not every dog is suited for the dog park. But sometimes it can be overwhelming. This guy, I think he sees a lot of the dogs but doesn't know how to really play with them. So getting one-on-one -on -one time for a play date would be awesome. And then some dogs are aggressive. They're, like, they're better in a one-on-one -on -one situation where there aren't as many triggers as there are at the as you can see, this enclosed area of the dog park behind me allows dog owners to come and let their pets off the leash to roam freely. But what happens in the colder months of December and January where dog owners don't know exactly where to bring their dogs to play? Well, I spoke with the local dog owner on why he feels the idea behind Pinder could be useful during that time. We just got our dog in the past few months, so um, we are a little bit uh, worried about the winter and not really sure what our game plan is. Um, our hope was that we could maybe take her on runs or things like that, but as far as getting her uh, socialization during that time, it's definitely going to be a challenge. And um, Yeah, I could see how having some kind of network to, to socialize um, or to meet dogs with whom we can socialize her would be, would be pretty valuable. The site has features similar to Tinder, such as the personalization of your pet's profile, the swipe right or left to match or not with others, and the ability to view who they matched with. Right now, PinderPets.com is running a Halloween costume contest until October 31st. No human entries allowed. And finally, the debut of a new feature on our newscast. Sydney's Media Moment will provide creative and enlightening glimpses into the world of entertainment, especially the movies. In honor of the recent celebration of Rosh Hashanah, we start with an appreciation of Mel Brooks, arguably our zaniest Jewish film director. Here's ACMI's Sydney Britt. Hello Arlington, I'm Sydney Britt, and I welcome you to Sydney's Media Moment. Today is September 18th, which means it's the first day of Rosh Hashanah. In honor of the Jewish New Year, I want to celebrate acclaimed Jewish director Mel Brooks. For those of you that don't know who Mr. Brooks is, I'll give you the quick rundown. Brooks is an American Jewish director known for creating films in the genres of farce, parody, and satire. He's also created a number of TV shows, including Get Smart, and a few musical comedies, including The Producers. Throughout the span of his currently 71-year-long career, Brooks has created a number of iconic films. Today I want to discuss his three most popular movies, Young Frankenstein, Blazing Saddles, and The Producers. Let's start our moment of appreciation with Brooks's brilliant parody, Young Frankenstein. This 1974 comedy, as you could guess, is a direct parody of the 1931 classic creature feature, Frankenstein. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! <laughs> this movie follows Dr. Frederick Frankenstein. That's Frankenstein. Who has just inherited the estate of his infamous grandfather. After he arrives at the estate, he begins to recreate the experiments of his grandfather, assisted by the hunchbacked Igor, the beautiful Ingar, and the crotchety Frau Blucher. Shenanigans ensue when Frankenstein's monster is brought to life, all the while Frankenstein's fiance is visiting. If you're blue and you don't know where to go to, why don't you go where fashion sits? This movie is a hilarious romp, filmed in the same style as the universal horror films from the 30s. It's heavy with innuendo, puns, and physical comedy, and is sure to make anyone laugh. The movie is rated PG by 70s standards, so I would say it's rated PG-13 by today's standards. Next on the list is Brooks' 1974 western, Blazing Saddles. This piece of comedy genius tells the story of a black man named Bart, played by Cleavon Little, who becomes the sheriff of a small town in the West, Rockridge. While the racist townspeople don't take to Bart at first, he eventually gains the respect with the help of his drunkard deputy, Jim, played by Gene Wilder. Well, my name is Jim. 
But most people call me... Jim. This satire of Western films pokes fun at the taboo topic of racism and is filled to the brim with innuendos, vulgarities, more innuendos, and is overall a total laugh fest. I think I'd better straighten myself out. Need any help? Oh, all I can get. The movie's rated R by 70s standards, so it's pretty tame by today's standards, but I still don't know if I'd call it PG-13. But I was younger than 13 when I first saw it, so maybe PG-15? And finally we have Brooks's 1967 musical comedy, The Producers. This iconic piece of cinema is about Max, played by Zero Mostel, who was once the biggest producer on Broadway, but now has to beg for cash contributions. Desperate for money, Max's new accountant, played by Gene Wilder, offhandedly says that if he were to get investors for a show that totally failed, they'd be able to keep all the extra funds. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh-huh! So in order for this scheme to work, we'd have to find a surefire flop. What scheme? This leads to the production of the worst musical ever, Springtime for Hitler. Well, talk about bad taste. Satirical black comedy was Brooks's directorial debut. It was controversial from the start and received mixed reviews. Despite the initial reception, it won the Academy Award for the Best Original Screenplay, and it's since become a beloved film among consumers and critics alike. Please don't jump on me! I'm not gonna jump! On The movie's rated PG by 16th standards, so I'd say it's at least PG-13 by today's standards. And that is the end of our list. Some quick honorable mentions include Spaceballs, Robin Hood Men in Tights, and I'll add in The Elephant Man, which Brooke secretly helped produce. I hope you have a wonderful Rosh Hashanah, and if you're blanking on ways to celebrate, put on a Mel Brooks film and enjoy the absurdity. That will do it for this week's newscast. We're very glad you could join us, and we invite you to sample more news programming and other great content on our website at acmi.tv. For ACMI News, I'm Kristen Bullier. You can always check out our latest segments and newscasts on the web at acmi.tv news. And don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at ACMI News. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. You'll find us at youtube.com slash ACMI News. If you have any news tips for us or wish to become a citizen journalist, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at news at acmi.tv or stop by ACMI Studio A at 85 Park Avenue.